Hey, good evening, everybody. How's everybody going? My name is John Stoffker. I am a principal security consultant at Trace 3. Um, they're sponsoring the night, but uh, this talk has nothing to do with about that or any, any what we sell. This is actually something that happened just recently in an incident response that we had, and I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, the title of the talk is, did that just really happen? So, um, ooh, first fail. Look at that. Bam. So, first and foremost, we are totally safe, right? Right? We trust everybody we do business with. We trust everybody we do transactions with. We are going to make the largest transaction, transaction of our adult life. We're going to trust somebody with a Gmail address or a live.com account, right? All right, so let me put together the scenario. We got Aunt May over here. She's old in her 70s. She just cashed out of retirement, going to buy a nice big house. She has Bob the Realtor and uh, Joe, Bob the Realtor's assistant, right? And unfortunately, in the middle of there is this nice little hacker dude. So what happens is that uh, Aunt May calls up her realtor and says, I want to buy this nice new house. Let's go make this happen. So Bob decides to call Joe's assistant. They start sending emails back and forth, getting things ready to go. And, all right, she's ready to go. She's got the money. She found the house she wanted. Let's make this transaction happen. Two of them start talking to a title company because that's what happens when you start these things going. So they start arranging the loan, they start talking to the title company. All this is happening via email, all this is happening via free email accounts off Gmail, live. Enter into your interloper who gets in between this communication and starts impersonating one side of the story. In fact, he does it so well, he convinces one or both sides to wire money to him rather than the respective accounts. How does this happen? The con is pretty simple. The attacker gets a hold of the victim's email account, sits on it for days, maybe weeks, reading, understanding, trying to plot the process of all these transactions, under, understanding how the, the flow of money is going to happen, when it's going to happen, and at some point, there's going to be something that happens that's going to trigger them to act. Maybe it's you know a closing date getting released or some mention of money changing hands, and that's when they that's when they strike. So they're going to find a way to get themselves in the middle and convince either side that they wanted some money to him, not the, the respective parties. In a real estate transaction, this could be the buyer. It could also be the other side of it, the seller. So we're going to try to convince the title company to release the funds to the interloper, not the actual seller, or we're going to convince the buyer to send the interloper the funds and not the real person. Wait, what? Huh? Let's go through this. This is an actual thing that happened. If you read through this, this is a, an actual title of an email I got. This was given to me as part of an incident response. If we look at that, it, it seems pretty legitimate, right? I mean, we got a reply to an email that we sent that just says, can you, can any of you email me the buyer's email before the end of day today? Pretty legitimate request, right? Except if you look up the top there, something's funny about that email address. It doesn't look right. It took me about a day and a half to figure out that there's something wrong with this after staring at it. What you'll notice there is at the end of Joe Title Guy, there's another email address. What I found out is that the RC for email allows you to put those uh, brackets or the uh, greater than less than inside the display name. So you can craft what looks like a legitimate envelope address inside the display name of an email and send it off. And most email clients will think of it as, a, as that first email address coming from, not the reply to. So that was one thing that kind of struck me as odd. But then the request is kind of odd too. Why would the uh, teller guy need to know the buyer's email address? What happened next was kind of funny. The, uh, the assistant replies back with, well, the buyer doesn't have email, she's 70. Th this is important in, in our chain of events because 
I don't think the person who was impersonating the title guy at this point expected this response. Because as part of their con, they're going to reach out and try to contact the buyer directly. That's part of the game. But now we, we've cut them off the knees saying, hey, she doesn't have email. She can't respond to you. So this isn't in the script. Wait, what are we doing? So now he fires back. Notice that the tone has changed now. We're, we're now demanding stuff. We require her to wire the closing funds prior to closing. Well, of course you would wire closing funds prior to closing. That's why they're closing funds. And if you notice, the English is now broken up. It, it's not as if we're like speaking intelligibly. So the attacker's now broken character. They're now getting aggressive. They've gone off script. They don't know what's going on. They're trying to assert control over the situation and regain what, what they've lost. And if you notice here too, we've now jumped in time. Well, let me go back a minute. Remember, we're on the 25th of January here. How do we go back to the 24th in a reply? This took me another day and a half to figure out what I was looking at. Because how can we have a threaded conversation that now ping-pongs back between two days, but both Outlook, Gmail, and Outlook.com have threaded it correctly, but it has shown us that we're moving forward and backwards in a day. And in the end, we have our assistant being the dutiful person that he is, saying, hey, don't worry, we got it. Just forward us all the information we need, and we'll make sure she takes care of it. He, he's, doing, he's doing the needful, right? He's helping out. He, he's a person saying, hey, look, just give us what we need. And so our interloper now sends over. Now notice, again, the email address looks kind of funky, and the date's kind of off. But um, it's like, hey, well, we send the attached wire instructions. Just follow them, and everything's OK. So here's what you sent. And you notice you've got the awesome title company logo there. If you notice the account name, it looks kind of weird. Now, now I sanitize this for, for the group tonight, but rest assured that the name in front of that account name was actually somebody's real name. The sad thing is, is this went out to the buyer and she took this and she dutifully followed the directions. She went down to Wells Fargo, she filled out a wire request, wired quarter million dollars off to some foreign person because she thought she was doing the needful. She thought she was doing exactly what she was asked to do by this person who appeared to be from the title company because if we go back, that email address, when it showed up in, in her inbox or in the inbox of her realtor, looked legitimate. So here's a sequence of events. Now I, I noticed that we flip-flopped back and forth. What happened and what I realized was that the attacker was actually in a different time zone. And so when the two mailing systems were trying to reconcile what time that was, they threaded the information, they threaded the conversation in chronological order, but they kept the time as it was displayed. So while it was doing the right thing by keeping everything in chronological order, it was displaying to me what time would be displayed on the attacker's side. So I was able to take the piece of information I knew, which was the one email that started the whole thread, and everything else from that that was forwarded to me, and work backwards to figure out exactly where this attacker lived and, and what was actually going on, and create this timeline of how these emails actually went through, which, which helped in our investigation in understanding what exactly was going on here. Because when I was brought into this incident, we were given this idea that there was an email sent out, and we never sent it, but uh, it claims to be from us, so we need to make sure that we're not at fault. So how all this happened? By changing the display name of the email, email envelope to something that looked like a legitimate address, the attacker was able to fool most of the online web-based uh, email system into displaying the email address they wanted it to see. So I went and did a, did a test. Uh, over on the far side, you see there's uh, Gmail. It actually won't let you do this through their web interface. But if you connect it through mail on your Mac, totally fine. 
So the top one there is a test that I took where I just sent myself an email with that aforementioned uh, messed up display string. And there's what it looks like. Notice, again, we get that same weird artifact at the end of it where we're seeing the actual email address at the end of it, but most people's eyes are only focused on what's in bold. They don't understand what's coming afterward and they, they ignore it. So let's look at the next one. This is Outlook.com. Notice Outlook.com doesn't even show you the real email address. They mask it. If this email were to show up in Outlook.com, you would legitimately think it came from me, but it actually came from a spoof address. So this is what the attacker used to, to get the roots on and to claim as if they're part of this conversation that they weren't a part of. So what happened further than this, after the woman wired her money and Aunt May lost it all, uh, the attacker actually had about four or five mules ready at different ATM locations around Houston to withdraw all the money. And um, unfortunately, they only got away with about 2,000 bucks before a B of A kind of caught them and shut them down. But it wasn't because of this, it was more that they violated the Superman principle of you can't be at four different ATMs at one time withdrawing a large amount of cash before the bank's gonna shut you down. So it was interesting to, to note during this whole process that we had to backtrack through all these emails and figure out that it was just a, a simple display preference that was able to convince these people the conversation they were having was actually with a person that they were already having a conversation, already having a trust relationship with, rather than the interloper. And really it comes down to, in this case, Outlook.com and their choice to fully mask the reply to address and give you what was in the display name field. Any questions? Nothing. What's that? Oh, sorry, go for it. Oh. Hold on, we're running back. Oh, sorry. How did they know that it was closing and to send that email, or did they just send it off randomly in hopes that there happened to be a title closing? So, in, in this case, the attacker actually had control over the victim's email. So, what we found out in most of these cases, with realtors in particular, the attackers are, are choosing people who are using free email services and not using 2FA. So, they're not using two-factor authentication. These accounts get cracked easily. They sit and they watch. And they're very adept at what our processes are in the American financial system of these high value transactions. I mean, it could be, in this case, it was buying a home. It could easily be buying or trading stocks. Whatever it may be, they are keyed in to wait and just be quiet until that, that situation arrives. In this case, what spurred it was a request from the title company to move up the closing date. Uh, in, in the real situation, the lady had some personal matters she had to attend to. She had to bump up the closing date to a specific time. Once that email went out, it triggered the actor to then act within a day to escalate the situation and to, to get his con in order. If it wasn't for the audible of the, the buyer not ever having an email account, we probably would never have caught this because he would have gone straight to her and we would have never heard about it. Anybody else? Did they have cyber insurance? Did they have cyber insurance? No, they did not, unfortunately. Although, I don't think it would have helped. Does she live with you now? Does she live with me now? No, unfortunately. Um, I don't even actually know the woman. I never met her. Um, we were brought in from an outside third party to investigate to see what actually happened and make sense of all this because when I got brought in, all I had was a string of emails and an accusation on one side or the other that somebody had just stolen a quarter of a million dollars. Next one. All right, guys, I guess I'm shutting down. <laughs>